internal mammary vessels for microvascular autogalous breast reconstruction. Thank you. Can everyone, everyone hear me? Okay. Thank you so much for those kind introduction, and it was lovely. Um, so much pressure being the last talk today, and there were, we had so many great speakers today, and what an honor for me to receive this award, um, especially being a female osteopathic student aspiring to be a surgeon. Uh, it means a great deal to me, and I'm very, very honored and very grateful for this opportunity to share my project with everyone today. So thank you for staying at this point for my final talk. So today I'm going to share uh, what I've been working on the past year. So my research team and I are very, very excited. Um, so we worked on locating the internal memory vessels in relation to um, the microvascular autologous breast reconstruction. So the, uh, the, any anatomists that are out there are probably cringing at the fact that I'm calling these vessels internal memory vessels because uh, anatomically they are referred to as internal thoracic vessels. So those are the same vessels, while well, I will be referring them to as internal memory vessels as it's an uh, anatomical study with clinical significance. So. so breast cancer in the United States is a big deal because about 12.5% of the population will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer in their lifetime. And about almost half of the patients will be treated with total mastectomy. So we're talking radical mastectomy where they will, in, they will remove all breast tissues. And as a female, everyone you know, can understand that breast is a huge contributing factor for their confidence, their body image, and it kind of defines your femininity. So what happens when that factor, that is gone? And so the patient's going through being diagnosed with the cancer, so that's traumatic enough. But then now the doctor's gonna say, well, we're gonna remove your breasts because that's part of the treatment. And in being an osteopathic student, and the osteopathic medical studies or teachings always tell us, think holistically, think about how you can treat the patient, not only the disease, but the, how you could improve the quality of life for that patient. So an option for breast cancer patients who underwent mastectomy is breast reconstruction. So an op this option, um, the rate of breast reconstruction in the states have been rising steadily in the past two decades, especially thanks to this act that was passed in 1998. So Women's Health and Cancer Right Act is an act that allowed insurance coverage for patients with uh, mastectomy for breast reconstruction. So making it more affordable for the patients. And so it's been rising, the rate has been rising the past 20 years, and we predict it to rise even more. And for obvious reasons, uh, breast reconstruction can reestablish that lost confidence, lost femininity in your body image, your confidence, your self-esteem, um, and therefore improving the quality of life for the patients. And there are a lot of different, different breast reconstruction options. So what I would like to think of as breast reconstruction is that there is an implant-based breast reconstruction and there's an autologous breast reconstruction. So autologous breast reconstruction involves harvesting your own skin flap versus implant-based uh, breast reconstruction will be using silicon implants and um, making breasts out of those implants. So other than the fact that there are procedural differences between the implant reconstruction and the autologous reconstruction, there's also a difference, a big difference in oh, how the patients perceive the procedures. So there is a big literature um, supporting evidence, supporting um, the surveys that the patients took after each procedure, that there's a higher satisfaction for the patients who chose the autologous breast reconstruction versus patients who chose the implant-based um, reconstruction. And those factors that were surveyed were aesthetics and clinical complications or frequent clinical visit, visits and uh, just looked at overall quality of life So of all the, uh, the previous slides showed different types of autologous breast reconstructions. And the gold standard for 
breast autologous breast reconstruction is this procedure right up here called the deep inferior epigastric perforator flap procedure. So that's a mouthful, so I'm gonna be calling it as the deep flap. So basically, um, I'm going to walk you through the illustration of the procedure so that we can discuss the important stuff after that. So the first, I'm going to talk about where you can find these vessels. So the number one is showing where the harvesting site is. So this deep flap will harvest a skin flap in the abdominal area. And you can imagine in the abdominal area, the deep inferior epigastric vessels will perforate your six pack muscles or your rectus abdominis muscle. And these perforator, perforators are what's being harvested along with the skin flap as well as the subcutaneous fat. And then that will be made into breasts. So number two is just showing you the surgical markings where the surgeons will make incisions. So in this illustration, we're talking about unilateral mastectomy with unilateral breast reconstruction. So when we look at number three, the tissue flap has been harvested already, and you can see it's been transposed here. And these inferior epigastric perforators that were harvested along with your skin graft or your flap will be anastomosed with the internal memory vessels up in the chest. And then four is showing the final reconstructed product. So notice that the, all the important structures happen to be vessels. So in the microvascular surgery, it's really important that you locate and properly dissect the vessels without injuring them. When you injure these vessels, then you, you totally compromise the whole procedure. So there is no surgery once the vessels are injured. Um, usually these, these procedures will take about 10 hours if we're talking bilateral reconstruction, and that's minus the mastectomy part. So about four plastic surgeons will be present, two plastic surgeons will be on the chest, and the other two plastic surgeons will be on the abdomen area working on, har working on harvesting the tissue flap. So it's a, it's a pretty intense surgery. When I was in the OR with the plastic surgeons, there was no music, no small talk, uh, unlike the other ORs that I shadowed. So it was, a, it was a more intense procedure. So what do surgeons really see in real life? So here, if you can take a look here, I have a scale here to kind of portray to you how small the surgical window really is in this microvascular surgical procedures. So this particular picture was taken, uh, thank you Dr. Butterworth, uh, at third costal cartilage level. So it's on the right side on your third rib um, where the rib and the, the sternum meets that cartilage, that's where the dissections happen. So that, if I don't know if, people in the back can read that, but that's 1.5 inches and 38 millimeters. So if you put that up here, that's how big really is the surgical window. And if you know your metric system or your you know, English system, that's a very small incision. And you can see the vessels and it's magnified, but really those are two to three millimeters thick. And while this dissection is happening simultaneously, the surgeons uh, in the abdominal area will be harvesting the flaps ready to be used. So before I move on any further, I want to talk about the internal memory vessels. So the internal memory vessels are right here, and they are really highly sought after vessels, not only in autologous breast reconstruction, but also in bypass surgery. So that's the biggest example I can tell you. So for coronary bypass, they like to use the internal memory vessels because they have really good high flow rate. They don't really get atherosclerotic plaques or you know, they're really good caliber vessels. So they like to use them. And also in head and neck uh, reconstruction, they like to use internal memory vessels. And so internal memory vessels are used as recipient vessels for all the autologous breast reconstruction. And 
as you can see, it is right behind the anterior chest, anterior thoracic wall. And we all know that even if you've never taken anatomy, that the heart and the lungs are very important organs, vital, right? And they are kind of in the same area. So they are in the thorax. So the internal memory vessels share its home with the heart and the lungs. So I wanted to portray how important this relationship is because this is what the surgeons see. So you can see these internal memory vessels. Look how close they are to the lungs. They're just right by it, right on top of it, really. And here, the heart, and then unfortunately, these are cut sections, but they're still very uh, in close proximity to the heart as well. So what the surgeons have to deal with, uh, besides the fact that it's a high intense, you know, intensive surgical dissection, as well as the fact that you have a very small incision, there's a movement during surgery. So the patient's alive, so the patient's breathing, so the lungs are inflating and deflating, as well as if you're on the left side doing the dissection, then your heart's pumping. So there's that, that added movement, making it really high-risk dissection. So what did I find when I was reading all these crazy literatures out there? Um, so what I found was that the internal memory vessels indeed are the most favored vessels as a recipient for autologous breast reconstruction, and that was very apparent. However, what I didn't find really was that there was a lack of studies done about the vessels in relation to these autologous breast reconstructions. So there were a lot of papers that were talking about the internal memory vessels or internal thoracic vessels about the, with the radiology or the cardiothoracic surgeries or head and neck reconstructions, but there weren't any anatomical studies done in relation to the microvascular autologous reconstruction. So as I was talking about the challenges that the surgeons face during these microvascular reconstruction. So to recap, it was the fact that the small, they have a very small surgical window, and then the, they have an added movement to it. Um, the one thing that I could really address was help them find the vessels in a more reliable way because I can't really make the patient stop breathing or you know, help the patients stop pumping their you know, heart or anything like that. So the one thing that I could do was do this research to find a reliable measurement for the surgeons to go in there and say, hey, these are my safer dissection zones, my more accurate and reliable dissection zones. So what I did was I did some quantitative data collection and upon running some analysis, I was looking for a safety uh, dissection zone. So the, my data collection happened during cardiopulmonary lab for the first year students here at KCU. So what we do in the lab is that we First, look for the subclavian artery and the vein because the IMV and IMA are going to be the branches of these subclavian vessels. And we use the, once you identify it, what we do is that we make this cut so that we can lift the anterior chest off the cadaver. And we cut through the seventh or, two, or the eighth rib and when we're reflecting it and removing the chest, we make sure that the vessels are stuck to the anterior chest so that the integrity of the vessels and the anatomy of the vessel would be preserved. So I used 30 cadavers, and since the dissection was done bilaterally, that resulted in 60 sites, so 60 arteries and 120 veins. So 120 veins because the veins bifurcate. Any specimens that had prior surgery, like thoracic surgery, or any illnesses, or any other reason why there would be a disruption in the integrity of the anatomy or the vessels were all excluded, including any dissection error that occurred during the data collection. 
So some of the important landmarks that I used to collect data were these, so the second costal car cartilage, third costal cartilage, and the fourth costal cartilage. The reason why I chose those three spots was because they are the most commonly dissected sites for microvascular autologous breast reconstruction, and the most common out of three being the third costal cartilage. The next, what I looked at was the intraoperative landmarks. So when the surgeons are looking uh, down at the chest and doing the dissection, what can they find reliably in order for them to, in order for me to help them locate these vessels? And the costal chondral junction was one of them, and the other one that I looked at was a lateral sternal border. So those were the landmarks that I used to make measurements, um, distances of the vessels. So the distances were measured in millimeters with using the micro caliper, and um, it was either between the vessels or between the landmark and the vessels. So what did I find? So the common bifurcation pattern that's out in teaching, so when the plastic surgeons are being taught where the common bifurcation happens, is the fourth intercostal space. But what I found was it's actually in the third intercostal space. That's the most common bifurcation uh, area. But what we don't see with just this information is that there's an important clinical relevance that we're missing when we're looking at it just the common site because the left and the right side of bifurcation pattern are different. So the right side actually bifurcates lower than the left. So this illustration is an inside out view. You're looking at it and it's just showing how it's bifurcating in the third intercostal level for the left, and then the fourth in the right. Another measurement that I took were distances between the vessels. I wanted to see how far apart the vessels might be. So is it really, if I find one vessel, Am I expecting to find the other one fairly quickly, or is there a big you know, distance? What we found was the distance, the mean distance between these vessels were all less than, a, less than five millimeters, really. I mean, I can't even really do that with my fingers, so I think it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty small distance, and I think it's, it's almost safe to say that we can, um, consider these vessels to be bundled together in pretty close proximity. So you can see this was an, um, this, is kind of, this is the intraoperative view, and you can see that is a centimeter, and if you put that around, that would be about a centimeter here. And then the surgical window being about two centimeters in this picture. Another distance that I measured was from the lateral sternal border and the vessels. So the green arrow showing over here is just showing the, the distance that I measured. So why is the lateral sternal border to medial IMV more important than the others? Is because from the, your lateral sternal border, pretty medial structure, as you go out laterally, the first structure that you're going to hit is the medial IMV. So that was the most important uh, distances that we had for, from this set. And the next we measured from the costal chondral junction to the vessels. So measurements like that. So when we had any vessels that kind of went diagonal, what we did was we measured the shortest distance. So you can see the bolded distances are costal chondral junction to the lateral IMV. So the same logic follows with the lateral sternal border to the medial IMV was the most important because we are talking about uh, costal chondral junction to coming medially. The first thing that you're going to hit is the internal memory vein. And if not, it would be the IMA. 
So with all these distances and the numerical data, we ran some analysis, and what we found, or what we established was this dissection zone. So we would like to call this as more reliable dissection zone for the, for the plastic surgeons during the microvascular reconstruction procedures. So the surgeons really will not like, not like it if I put 1.98 millimeters. They really don't care. They really want just like simple, quick, you know, catch, catchy stuff. So what we did was we're gonna make it very simple, two centimeters from costochondral junction and 1.5 centimeters from costochondral junction on the right side. So the left, two centimeters, right, 1.5 centimeters. So uh, additional findings that um, the difference between the bifurcation was one finding that happened per laterality. And another finding um, was that the distances between left and the right also varied by about five millimeters. So that's why uh, these numbers differ a little bit. So the right side is la more laterally displaced compared to the left. And then we also noticed that the, uh, with the each rib level, there's a difference. And that kind of makes sense because when you think about the anatomy and the thorax, the ribs get short or get longer from two, three, four. So there is a little bit of a difference. So we have about five millimeters in difference with the each level. So we made it real simple, five, left, right, up, down. So kind of talk about how it relates to the surgery. So the surgeons would go in and find a rib, find the costal cartilage, so that's the junction, rib, and the cartilage, and they would go 1.5 millimeters, and should, that should be their dissection zone. So this is, these two photos are taken from on the right side at the third costal cartilage level. So these are both third costal cartilage dissections. So costal chondral junction, and then it would be 1.5 millimeters and you would hit the vein or the artery. So the final thoughts that, so bringing it all together, what I want to leave you with is that the laterality actually really matters when we're talking about the microvascular reconstruction surgery and because of the bifurcation pattern difference as well as that there is a distance difference between uh, left and the right. And my research team and I really hope that this information is helpful for the surgeons in improving the efficacy of the dissection. So we're, we would like to contribute so that it ensures more proper dissection, quicker dissection time, and giving that a little bit of confidence um, that there was some research done in this area. So I would like to thank everyone, my research team and the department, Dr. Seegers for my data organization and Dr. Olinger for the lovely illustrations and then the fellows for moral support and the donors for our school. Without them, uh, this study wouldn't have been possible as well as Dr. McCumber at University of Nebraska. Any questions? Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great work, really. <laughs> thank you. Uh, out of my curiosity, with this uh, autologous, uh, what was the other one? Breast reconstruction. Breast re reconstruction, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, the uh, micro surgery is really good and uh, successful and uh, feasible. But how about the innervation? You know, when the woman get this uh, uh, their own skin or the mm -hmm. flap operation and put it there, all the uh, vessels are connected. Mm -hmm. So but the how about the innervation? I mean, uh, will it establish the innervation, or how long will it take? Time or I don't know. I'm, since no, you screened the great. literature, you are more knowledgeable. I'm just curious about yeah, that. Yeah, no, great question. And actually, I was, I really wanted to look at the innervation before looking into the vessels. But the with the total mastectomy and removing all the breast tissue, and this is just my my own knowledge, I guess. I'm not a plastic surgeon or any surgeon by all means yet. So. 
my opinion, so I think when you remove all the breast tissue, every, all the innervation goes with the tissue removal. So I don't think that there is a way to reconnect those without preserving them somehow before you remove the tissues. And there, isn't, there hasn't been any, I don't think there's anything out there right now with the innervation because a lot of, and maybe that's why uh, there are procedures now with the nipple sparing, lumpectomies and whatnot to save that innervation. But a lot of times the nipples can't be saved in breast cancer. So I don't know. So the simple answer to your question is that I do not know. And I try to theorize, but that's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.